Alrighty, it's two o'clock on the nose, everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here. Um, again, welcome everyone. My name is Monica Olson and I'm the new policy associate here for accessibility at the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And this is somewhat of a new role. And welcome to How to Read a VPAT with our guest speaker, Terrell Thompson. We are really delighted to have you here today and learn more with us. I'm excited to share that over 50 individuals registered and plan to join us today. And that's quite the turnout for uh, the beginning of fall quarter in, in a global pandemic. So thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. You are here because you care about accessibility, particularly IT accessibility, and you want to learn more. Maybe you're in a position at your institution where you regularly make procurement decisions and you want to better understand how to consider and evaluate accessibility before you make those decisions. You might be in an accessible tech lead position or policy 188 coordinator position at your institution and you want to help educate others about how to consider accessibility when looking at information communication technology and procurement best practices. A couple of housekeeping items that I want to note. We do have a live captioner here with us today. So if you would like to follow along and use live captioning, please make sure you've selected the CC button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have technical issues, you may reach out um, to Shannon Bell or myself or put a question in the chat and we will help you to the best of our ability. The other thing I'd like to know is, as you probably are observing right now, we are using the Zoom webinar platform, not the meeting platform. So what this means is that you as the attendee can view the screen and hear the audio of your panelists and presenters, but we cannot see or hear you. So if you have a question during Terrell's presentation, we encourage and invite you to submit your question using the Q&A feature. At the bottom of your screen, you would select Q&A and type in your question there. I'll be doing my best to take note of the questions as they roll in and let Terrell and bring to Terrell's attention if there's something time sensitive. We also have left the last 30 minutes or so of our presentation specifically for Q&A as well. Okay, so without further ado, Terrell, I have the pleasure of introducing you. Terrell Thompson is manager of the IT accessibility team at the University of Washington, a role in which he works to promote IT accessibility by building community, developing resources, delivering lectures and workshops, such as today, conducting accessibility evaluations, providing consulting and a support to a wide variety of constituents and conducting research. Terrell has nearly 30 years of experience in the IT accessibility field, and we're really lucky that he's joining us today. So thanks again, Terrell, and I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you, Monica, and thanks everybody for being here today. I do, as I glance through the participant list, I, I see a few familiar names, so it's good to see those of you that I, uh, that I do know and have worked with over the years, um, but good to see new folks as well. Um, this is a topic that um, I've been given a lot of presentations on lately, um, and, and that is because procurement plays such an important role in the IT accessibility puzzle, um, and, and it's a challenging one. Uh, we at the University of Washington do have an IT accessibility team. As Monica said in my intro, I'm, I'm the manager of that team. Um, and people come to us when they're making uh, really high impact purchases of um, software that are gonna be deployed university wide and they're gonna affect all students or all employees or both. Um, and we get engaged with vendors then and we collaborate and try to ensure that that product is, is fully accessible. But we purchase thousands of IT products. Um, so, um, that's not a sustainable solution. They can't all come through us to review them for accessibility. And so everybody who has the power to make a purchasing decision needs to know at least a little something about you know, how to ask for accessibility, 
and how to judge whether a product is gonna, gonna create accessibility problems or not. And so that, um, that problem has been the reason why um, a couple of years ago, I started giving more talks about accessibility and procurement and looking at VPATs and um, you know, trying to explore together, you know, how can anybody review accessible, the accessibility of technology without necessarily being an accessibility expert? Um, and so that is what led to this presentation, which I've given a number of times or presentations like this. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to share uh, this with, with you all today. So let me um, share my screen. So again, uh, I am I'm Terrell Thompson, manager of the IT accessibility team. So we, we are part of the accessible technology services department, which is in UWIT, the central IT organization on campus. And our hub for communicating to campus um, on all sorts of things related to IT accessibility is uw.edu slash accessibility. So I'll share some additional uh, web resources um, throughout the presentation, but that, um, if you just remember that one, uw.edu slash accessibility, then everything else is uh, just an additional um, directory on top of that. So it'll be pretty easy to, to remember. So I am gonna use a few acronyms and I'll just um, share the, uh, the most prominent ones up front here so you'll be prepared for them. Uh, first is W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, they have uh, created the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, W-C-A-G. And they also have created a specification called ARIA, um, which stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And uh, the W3C is not involved in the VPAT, but that is an important part of what we're gonna be talking about today, and that is the voluntary product accessibility template. So each of these we're going to define more specifically as we get to them. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the process for considering IT accessibility and procurement from the University of Washington perspective. So I don't have an insider knowledge on how procurement happens within your um, domain, but uh, at the University of Washington, if it reaches a certain dollar threshold, it goes through procurement services, but there's a lot of uh, technology that's purchased that doesn't meet that threshold. And so that's kind of a wild west where anybody can put, you know, purchase on their pro card. So, so we do have formal procedures if a purchase goes through procurement services. Um, and we try to communicate to everybody who can purchase technology that you ought to uh, apply the same procedures as you're making purchases. Even though it isn't officially required, um, it is officially required it goes through procurement services, but, um, but everybody should consider these steps. So this is all spelled out at uw.edu slash accessibility slash procurement. We've got a lot of information there that mostly quotes from procurement services own policies and procedures, um, paraphrases them and summarizes them. Um, but that is a really good place to go for additional information. We've basically broken accessibility down into three phases within the procurement process um, where accessibility needs to be a consideration. First of all is upfront, when you are shopping for a product, and you solicit accessibility information. So that may be in an RFP um, or it may be less formally, um, just as you are talking to vendors about their products or doing research online, you need to ask about accessibility in order to find accessibility information. So we actually have specific language that gets plugged into RFPs. Um, and, and that is, I actually have a slide here that quotes from that but you can find that on our Procuring Accessible IT website as well. Second, after you ask for accessibility information, hopefully vendors provide accessibility information in response. If they don't, then they're not answering the question. So that you know, would hopefully be a red flag against them. 
But if they do, then we face the challenge of validating that accessibility information. Um, is what the vendor said credible? How do we know that? That really is a big piece of what we want to explore in the presentation today. Third, assuming that the accessibility is not 100%, and I, you know, I'm willing to say after you know, many years in this field and 20 years at the University of Washington, I, I honestly don't think I have seen a fully accessible product um, ever. They all for sh fall short in some way, some more significantly than others. Um, but where there are shortcomings, then we want some assurances that the vendor is going to address those shortcomings um, and that they're going to be a good partner and work to improve their accessibility over time. So we need to have faith that they are on board with that. Um, Otherwise, we're putting ourselves at risk by using their product. Um, so, um, so with that in mind, we want to include accessibility assurances in contracts. That involves a lot of negotiation. Again, on our Procuring Accessible IT website, we do have some recommended language as a starting point that you get plugged into contracts. And we actually at the University of Washington, University of Washington have uh, an accessibility rider that gets added to the, it's part of the UW um, uh, terms, um, standard terms of agreement that uh, all vendors must um, you know, sign off on. But when it comes to the accessibility rider, a lot of vendors will redline that and send us back an edited version. And then it ends up being a negotiation, you know, what, how much risk are we willing to take if they don't have an accessible product and they're, they're not willing to commit to making that accessible, um, maybe at the level that we, we want. Um, there's probably gonna be some compromise and um, so that some negotiation needs to happen. But ultimately they do need to be expected to work on their accessibility. Um, otherwise it is a much higher risk for us if we purchase a product that's not accessible and deploy that product and we have um, you know, no expectation that it's ever gonna be made um, more accessible. So um, I won't read all the text on this slide, but it is this is the information um, that, that is recommended for being plugged into RFPs. Um, sometimes it gets uh, edited a little bit depending on the product and, and the circumstances. But the heart of this is that we are expecting um, accessibility as measured by WCAG. There's that acronym, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and specifically version 2.1 level 2a that is our expectation for all it that we create or that we purchase that we deploy it needs to meet WCAG 2.1 level 2a um, and the kind of a standard means by which vendors document their accessibility and specifically whether they are compliant with WCAG is the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, or VPAT. And so we accept VPATs as a means of documenting how well your product does on the WCAG um, standards. And we actually have quite a bit of additional information here in this, uh, this text that um, specifies what our expectations are related to the VPAT. We expect version 2.3 or higher, so it needs to be a reasonably new VPAT. Um, and we expect them to complete it accurately. And that, you know, most of the text on this kind of elaborates a little bit on that, that there are some things, you know, the vendors tend to skip over that are we consider important. And so we want you know, them to understand that you know, we're taking this seriously. This is not just a checkbox that we, you know, are going to say, okay, they submitted a VPAT, we're good to go, let's move on. So this is all rooted in laws and in policies. Um, so I just spent a little bit of time on this, um, but yeah, at the heart of it is federal law, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which has been around since 1973. That required that federal, um, that recipients of federal funding ensure that their programs and services are accessible. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 um, expanded that. So it wasn't just uh, recipients of federal funding. It was a much broader um, uh, you know, group of, of entities that were um, needing to comply with that law. 
and essentially that expanded to all of society in, a, in you know, many ways. Um, society needs to be accessible. Programs and services that are provided to people without disabilities need to also be accessible to people um, with disabilities. And so both of those laws um, were enacted before technology was anywhere near what it is today. Uh, the, the web was in its infancy in 1990, just being invented. And um, since then, you know, the web has grown exponentially and software has grown exponentially. And, and we now are using technology to deliver our programs and services extensively. And so we still though need to be sure our programs and services are accessible. So the fact that we're delivering them using a different means than we were back then doesn't change the requirements. It, um, yeah, we still, it, the focus is programs and services and ensuring that those are accessible. Um, there have been over 500 legal complaints filed against higher education institutions for having inaccessible IT. Um, so that just sort of reinforces that this is a requirement um, based on federal law. Uh, Washington State Policy 188, um, you probably are all familiar with, but it applies to all of us. Um, it's state agencies, including higher education institutions, it specifically states that. Um, and and uh, the heart of this policy is that people with disabilities have access to and use of information and data um, and, and are provided access to the same services and content that is available to persons without disabilities. And uh, it goes on to, uh, to adopt WCAG 2.1 level 2A as the standard that we all are expected to meet for the technology that we're using. So that gets us then into the standards. Um, I've mentioned this already a few times, but WCAG uh, from the W3C is the standard, not just for web accessibility, but really for anything with a user interface. Um, the principles that are built into uh, WCAG apply to, to all sorts of, of technologies. Um, it is an, an international web accessibility standard, and it, it really has been around since the very early days of the web. I mentioned that the web was invented. Tim Berners-Lee did that in 1990 or thereabouts, created the very first web page, which still exists today. Um, it's a fully accessible web page, but it's pretty simple, uh, mostly text, but headings. And in, in the very first HTML specification, Tim Berners-Lee specified that HTML headings needed to be in order and that you shouldn't skip levels um, you know, within the heading structure. Um, and also alt text on images was there in the very first um, specification. So, um, so accessibility has been there since the beginning. And after the web was invented, the W3C was formed as an organization that would sort of oversee the, the web um, and maintain standards and develop standards and so forth. And they recognized very early on that accessibility could be a problem. And that was contrary to the vision. Uh, the web was intended to be the big equalizer, breaking down barriers and access to information. You know, people around the world would have unprecedented access to information you know, like never before. And the fact that the web could perhaps cause uh, some people to not have access, that it could actually be a barrier rather than an equalizer was cr contrary to the vision. And so the W3C formed very early on the Web Accessibility Initiative. That was a group within the W3C. And they began working early in the 90s on the very first Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So that took in W3C fashion many years because they brought lots of stakeholders together. They wanted every voice to be heard. And uh, that results then in a very uh, lengthy process. But the very first WCAG uh, version 1.0 was published in 1998. So it's been around for a very long time. Um, it was updated 10 years after that, um, version 2.0. And, um, and that is actually pretty close to 2.1, but it has continued to evolve over time. So 10 years later, 2.1 was released. And that is the current standard. There, 2.2 uh, is um, on the horizon. We'll probably see that soon. And there's a 3.0 that is in early stages of development. So this is a moving 
uh, dynamic standard, but 2.1 is right now what the published standard is. Within uh, version 2.0 and 2.1, we have various levels of uh, organization within the standards document. But at the deepest level, we have very specific success criteria. So these are the nuts and bolts. What do I need to do to make sure my technology is accessible? Um, well, you need to have alt text on images as an example, because a lot of people know about that one. Um, if you don't have alt text on images, then you know somebody who can't see the image doesn't have access to it. So alt text provides a description that um, assistive technologies can read. So, um, so that's an example of a success criterion. And there are actually 78 of those um, built into WCAG 2.1. And each one is assigned a level. So you have level A, level 2A, and level 3A. And that speaks to um, a couple of things. One is the, the significance. Um, level A success criteria are a higher priority um, than level 2A or level 3A. So these are things that um, you know, if you don't meet the level A success criteria, there are going to be groups of users who just don't have access to your content. Um, you know, they're barriers that they, they're insurmountable barriers. Level 2A is a little bit less significant, um, but, uh, but nevertheless, pretty significant. Level 3A, uh, less significant still. Although it's not just significance, it also, they considered difficulty of implementation as they were coming up with the level assignments. So there are some in level 3A that are actually quite, uh, quite significant, but very difficult to implement. And so they, they then got that lower level because uh, it's unrealistic to expect all content to comply with, you know, with this particular success criterion. So in the early days, uh, when version 2.0 was first released with this level A, 2A, and 3A model, there were a lot of questions about what level is the baseline? Do we have to meet all 78 success criteria or is it just a, a, you know, a subset? And that has since been clarified, mostly through, through the law, through legal settlements and um, uh, resolutions that have very clearly stated that the expectation is level A and level 2A. Um, and so policies have been formed around that expectation, including policy 188, which specifies that we must meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A, which also includes the level A success criteria. So we're talking about 50 success criteria. Ideally, we meet all 78, but we specifically need to focus on those 50. So that's a lot, 50 success criteria. I, you know, I mentioned at the onset that you know, we're trying to make this accessible, this topic accessible to people who are not necessarily accessibility experts. And, um, and, and WCAG is not, not easy reading. If somebody sits down and tries to make sense of it, it's, it's not you know, easy. Um, so I, I like for the purposes of reviewing technology for accessibility and trying to understand whether a product or service that we are considering for a purchase um, is accessible, we can just focus on three success criteria. Um, so that may be oversimplifying a little bit, but I think we can learn so much from these three success criteria that it really does provide a good foundation. So that's kind of the heart of my message here in this, this talk is three success criteria. I'll explain each of them and then we can um, dig a little deeper and look at some examples um, to, to see what we can learn from these three success criteria. So the first of those is 1.3.1. Um, info and relationships is the name of it, and that is a level A success criterion. And um, this I've selected as one of the three because it is so important. Um, and the the editors and authors of WCAG will tell you that you know we really can't cherry pick that there are no success criteria, particularly you know, if they're level A, then all level A success criteria are equally important. None are more important than the others. But I would argue that if there's anything that is more important than anything else, it is structure 
communicating the structure of a web page or a digital document um, goes a long way toward making that accessible as opposed to completely inaccessible if it has no structure. So an example is headings. Um, if you've got a document that is, um, you know, it's all text and you've got headings, visible headings, subheadings, sub subheadings, to kind of organize that and break it into different chunks, then visibly you can glance at that document, you can see those headings and they're usually recognizable because they're bigger and bolder and it's kind of set that text apart. Um, and that helps you to jump through the document, kind of scan it, look for the sections that you know, are particularly of interest to you, and then you can hone in on the particular section you're looking for. So you don't have to read every word starting from the top of the document all the way through line by line by line by line and try to make sense of that. For a screen reader user, if those headings are not tagged as headings, um, H1, H2, H3, using HTML terms, um, then, then a screen reader doesn't have the same structure. They don't understand the relationships between all the parts. They don't know, you know how the document is organized. It's just one linear block of text from beginning to end, which is extremely cumbersome to try and figure that out um, and try to navigate. So headings really are super important. But it's not just headings, uh, labels on form fields. If, you, if you're trying to fill out a form and it's not clear what the prompt is for a particular form field, then that can be very difficult to fill that form out. If you're looking at a data table and you've got many columns and many rows of information and you're navigating through that with a screen reader moving linearly across a row, and you know, it's populated with a bunch of numbers and every cell sounds the same, you really need to be able to track which column you're in, which heading you're in. And the key to that happening is having appropriate markup, appropriate code under the hood that establishes um, you know, that this is a column header, and this is a row header, and this is a heading, and this is a label for this form field. All of that information needs to be explicitly communicated via the code. And that's, you know, it's an HTML idea, but it's, it's universal when we're talking about digital documents. PDFs have an underlying tag structure that, you know, the same issues that apply to web pages also apply to PDFs. Microsoft Word, same thing. Um, any sort of digital document format um, supports structure or semantics in some way, and that all needs to be done properly in order for accessibility to happen. So, um, so what I what I just explained may sound a little bit technical, and so you're you're being held accountable for three success criteria here, and the main idea is just that structure information relationships is important. Um, that's you just kind of need to know that, and you need to have a general understanding of what that means. Maybe not the specifics, and when you read a VPAT, with that in mind, often you can tell whether a vendor knows what they're talking about or not, because you have a general understanding of this uh, success criteria. And so you can look for um, clues that they know what they're talking about when you see their responses. Second example is 2.1.1, um, which is called keyboard, very simple. And that too is a level A success criterion. And I've chosen this one because it is so easy to test. It, it basically, it, it just means all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface. So if a person can't use a mouse, which uh, many people can't, um, it, you know, somebody with a physical disability, phys physically unable to use a mouse, maybe using the keyboard to navigate through content using the tab key, shift tab to go backwards um, and maybe some other keys that make sense. So if you land on something that seems like maybe you know pressing enter now will you know click this button or pressing space may click this button um, or maybe using the arrow keys will move this slider. Um, you know keys that make sense. Um, you know it 
the interface needs to be operable just with keyboard. So anybody can test this. You don't need accessibility checkers. You don't need assistive technology. All you need is a keyboard and you can test whether a product is accessible um, you know, without a mouse. Finally, um, the third is, uh, is included here because it plays such a critical role in modern web-based applications. So it is 4.1.2, name, role, and value, also level A. And essentially what that means um, is that the application is using ARIA properly. It may be that they're using HTML properly too, but ARIA definitely plays a role. Anytime you have a web application where there are dynamic things happening, um, you click a button and a dialogue pops up, or you hover over a menu item and a submenu pops up. Um, anything that happens dynamically on the same page that you're on is going to require ARIA in order for that dynamic behavior to be made accessible. So, so understanding this requires that you know a little bit about ARIA. ARIA, as I mentioned at the onset, um, stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It is a, another W3 specifica W3C specification focused on accessibility. The goal here is to improve, to, to add um, to HTML or supplement HTML with additional markup that makes accessibility um, happen. So HTML itself has some limitations when it comes to accessibility, communicating, you know, all of the stuff that's happening dynamically on, on, uh, in an application. And so ARIA steps to the plate to fill those gaps and communicate to assistive technologies uh, in a way that makes complex user interfaces more accessible. So, so the name of this success criterion, um, roles, states, and properties has to do with you know, all of that information being what's exposed uh, via ARIA to assistive technologies. So best way to understand ARIA is to look at an example. And this is, um, we're gonna delve into code here. Um, so I apologize if anybody's not a coder, but I will present this in a way that is hopefully uh, palatable even to non-coders. But uh, essentially here, uh, we have some HTML. There are two, elements as they're called two two components to a web page one of those is a button um, and that is indicated here in the code with a button tag and a slash button tag is the end of that button and inside of those you've got the, the phrase more info so this is a button that would say on the screen it would look like a button and it would say more info and then when a user clicks on that button um, the, the div, which is that second component, appears. So that, this is what would happen with this interface. You've got a button, you click the button, and this content that previously was hidden um, suddenly appears. And that div it has an ID of info1. Um, so that, you know, that's going to play a role behind the scenes. But the content of that div just says this section contains more info. And, and again, that you know, probably would be invisible by default. You click the button and it becomes visible. So that's not gonna be an accessible experience for somebody who can't see what's happening. And so they, they're using a screen reader, they land on the more info button. That is, is our, articulated to them with the screen reader. It would say more info button. And they click on that, some text appears, but the screen reader user has no idea that text just appears. All they know is they clicked on a button and nothing seemed to happen. So they may click on the button again um, and maybe that hides the content and they have no idea that the first time they clicked the button that some new content appeared. Um, so they're not getting the feedback they need in order to understand, to fully understand this relationship and what, you know, what just happened when I clicked on this thing. So this is where HTML in and of itself is not up to the challenge of making that interface accessible. It's a very simple interface, but it needs some ARIA. Um, it just needs a couple of attributes on the button. If we add ARIA controls 
um, equals info one, that is referencing the ID of that controlled content. So it's saying the button controls this other content, uh, the content that's in the div with the ID of info one. So it establishes that explicit relationship between the button and the div. And now the screen reader understands that there is this relationship and it can communicate that to its users if it, if it needs to. The other um, even more important piece is ARIA expanded, which is currently false. That says that the button, the, the content controlled by the button is not currently expanded. And so when a screen reader user lands on this button, it's, it's now gonna say more info button collapsed because it's not expanded. The opposite of that is collapsed. So the user knows, okay, there's some content controlled here. When I click the button, that should expand that content and then that content will be accessible to me. They click the button, the screen reader says expanded. And now they know, okay, I, I know what happened. I just clicked the button, I expanded something. Some screen readers will provide a keyboard shortcut to allow the user then to go directly to that, that content that just appeared. Others don't do that. So it's imperfect implementation or inconsistent implementation among screen readers. But if the two items are adjacent, the screen reader user can just go down and discover the content that just got expanded. So, so um, the important thing here again is not for you to, to learn ARIA and to memorize all the ARIA um, attributes. There's a lot of ARIA markup and even you know, really skilled developers um, don't, don't know it all. There's a lot to learn, but the bottom line is just understanding what ARIA is and the role that it plays in making um, dynamic, complex, rich internet applications accessible. And a lot of the technologies we're talking about in procurement are, are now web applications. And so this directly applies um, to, to them. Um, so um, what is a VPAT then? I mentioned earlier that a VPAT plays a role in our understanding of a product's accessibility. That's exactly what it does. It stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. And this is a standard means by which IT vendors can provide documentation on whether and how they meet accessibility standards. So when we ask for, we ask the question, you know, do, does your product meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A? They can reply by providing us with a VPAT that specifically um, tells us that. Um, here's how we meet WCAG 2.1 level 2A or how we don't meet it. Um, and that as we will explore the VPAT in more detail and you'll see that it's important, both of those things are important, how we meet and how we don't meet. There are different versions of VPAT. Um, it's been around for a very long time. Um, it started with section 508, um, which was around uh, 1999, 2000. Um, and those were very old standards. The VPAT, you know, the section 508 required that federal agencies ensure their technology is accessible. They never, section 508 as a law has never applied directly to um, non-federal agencies. Um, it doesn't follow federal funding like section 504 does. So that often, that's a source of uh, a lot of misinformation. A lot of people think you know, section 508 is the law that we're all trying to meet. Uh, whereas uh, it, it generally is not um, in higher education unless our states or our institutions have adopted the Section 508 policies as their own, which Washington is not. Um, so, so we have no obligation to meet 508, but 508 did result in the first set of accessibility standards that were developed. And the VPAT was created for federal procurement officers who needed to have some means of telling whether a product was accessible because they were obligated to purchase accessible products. So uh, it is voluntary. So that's the V and VPAT is voluntary. Vendors don't have to fill this out, but if they were doing business with the federal government at the time, they needed to fill it out um, because that's what vendors were or what uh, procurement officers were asking for as documentation of accessibility. So, but we're not trying to meet 508, we're trying to meet WCAG. 
Um, and so the VPAT has evolved over the years. Version 2.3 was the first version that um, provided a mechanism for reporting on conformance to WCAG 2.1. There are some earlier versions that were WCAG 2.0, but since 2.1 is our standard, then uh, we need, this is why in our RFP language, we specify that it must be VPAT 2.3 or higher. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to, to answer the question of yeah, WCAG 2.1 um, compliance. So we actually still get a lot of old VPATs um, based on the old Section 508 standards, and that, that doesn't answer our question because it's a completely different set of standards. Uh, the latest version is 2.4. That was released in February 2020. So yeah, you know, there are some improvements you know, there. Um, so, but um, so it's good to probably keep an eye on on the improvements um, over time. But definitely, BPAT 2.3 um, have to do that, or you're not going to be able to answer the question. So within each each release, within version 2.3 or 2.4, there actually are four additions. That's important too because they they are based on different standards. So there is a WCAG 2.1 edition. Since that's what we're looking for, that's we need them to fill that out. Not the Section 508 not edition, not the European Union edition. The INT or international edition actually would qualify because it incorporates all three of the others. So some vendors may, you know, if it's a big corporation and they are doing business all over the world and, and with the federal government, and they need to document their accessibility on all the standards, then they may in fact do the INT because that's you know one VPAT that covers all audiences. And that's okay because it does include WCAG 2.1. So either the INT or the WCAG 2.1 additions are acceptable. So this is what a VPAT looks like. It um, contains three columns. It actually is pretty simple. Um, you've got the criteria over on the left. Then you have a conformance level in the middle, and then you have remarks and explanations. So the criteria contains one row for each WCAG success criterion. So we go back and we kind of look through that. They're all numbered. The ones that I had pointed out as being important. Um, uh, 1.3.1, info and relationships. That's the fifth line down. Uh, keyboard, 2.1.1. And uh, role states and properties is off the, the page, um, but that would be down near the bottom. All of these others, you know, play a role as well. But again, um, you know, you can just look at those three and learn a lot about a company's accessibility. So the conformance level, that middle column, <clears throat> is a multiple choice question. That's important because a lot of vendors fill this out wrong. Um, a product either supports, partially supports, does not support that success criteria, or it's not applicable, or they didn't evaluate it. So um, the difference um, between supports, partially supports, and does not supports. Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but it is explicitly defined in the instructions. Partially supports means some functionality of the product does not meet the criteria. So it, you know, maybe it mostly does, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, and of course, supports means it fully supports the criterion. Does not support um, is sort of the, you know, it's like partly cloudy versus partly sunny. Um, the majority of the product does not meet this criteria. There are a few exceptions where it does okay, but by and large, it does not meet the success criteria. So, so we just expect, um, you know, one of those answers in the conformance level column. The most important response though, comes in that third column, remarks and explanations where they provide the details to explain why they chose the answer that they chose. So if they chose, and that, that regardless of what their answer is, if they chose partially supports, we certainly want to know how they meet this criterion and how they don't. You know, what are the nature 
of the problems that you know exist and how significant are they in a person's ability to use the product. If they say supports, we still want to know how they came up to that, you know, why they say that. What is it that your product does that meets this success criteria and so that we can have some confidence in, in your answer. There's also um, required metadata at the top of a VPAT. There are 11 required fields in the instructions. Um, I actually, there are five that I am most interested in. Um, you know, the, the authors of the VPAT, you know, may feel that all 11, I mean, they're all required. And so uh, just follow the instructions, fill out all 11 required fields. But in particular, we need to know the name of the product and the version. We need to know which version was reviewed um, because if they, you know, if they released many versions of their product, you know, things change over time. And if we're looking at an older version, VPAT, that's not applicable to the version that we're looking to purchase, that's significant information. We also want to report dates. So, you know, if they haven't updated their VPAT in the last five years, then unless they haven't uh, updated their product in the last five years, then that report is out of date. The VPAT should keep up with the changes in the product. We also want contact information for follow-up questions, and we want that to be somebody who can answer the accessibility questions. Um, so a lot of times on VPATs, I see just a general help, um, you know, contact information. And that, you know, it's probably not going to be, it's not going to get us to the person we want to talk to, um, at least, you know, not, not easily and maybe not at all, but somebody filled out the VPAT. And so they presumably have some accessibility knowledge. Um, they definitely have knowledge of the form itself and why they chose the answers they did. That's the person we want to talk to. That's the person whose contact information should be provided. We also want to know how they did this. What evaluation methods did they use? Um, and um, what are the applicable standards and guidelines? It, it kind of is a given, you know, based on which form they have chosen. But, um, you know, we, we want it to be clear that they are um, documenting their conformance to WCAG 2.1 level 2A. So they need to explicitly state that in the required field. So quick guide to reading of EPAT. Uh, first of all, did they include all the required metadata? Um, if they didn't, what does that tell you about them? Um, you know, there are 11 required fields. If they, they can't follow that instruction and fill out all 11, it may tell us that they're hiding something. It may tell us they can't follow instructions and therefore you know, their credibility may be in question. Um, or it may tell us that they um, are just trying to get this passed through because it's a requirement with our, our purchasing procedures and, and they're just expecting to get a pass and don't wanna to spend too much time on it. Um, none of those are a good thing. Um, so, so that actually is you know, important information. You know, if, they were, if they filled the form out properly and included all the required fields, that's a plus for them. Um, and that, you know, number two, did they fill the form out properly? Not just did they include all the required information, but did they use one of the multiple choices in that second column? Does the remarks and explanation column have enough detail so that we can make an informed decision about the product's accessibility? That's the goal with this form, is to make it possible for us to look at this form and understand uh, more about the accessibility of the product. Um, and then finally, look a little closer at the three success criteria that we've been talking about, just to see what you can learn you know, about the product and about the company from those three. And as you're doing that, ask, first of all, who completed the VPAT? Um, an independent accessibility consultant is preferred. That way we're not reliant solely on the vendor. Um, and then, you know, often it's their marketing team that fills this out and tries to spin everything as a positive. Um, if, you know, if they uh, hire an accessibility consultant who evaluates the product and gives us an honest appraisal, um, then um, that, that always is going to just yield better information and more trustworthy information. Also, did they follow the instructions? Do they seem to be knowledgeable of accessibility based on what you now know of those three success criteria? 
does their answer make sense or does it seem like they're sort of out in left field and don't really know what they're talking about? Um, and after the, after reading their VPAT, ultimately, this is what it comes down to. Do you know more about the accessibility of their product? And what follow-up questions do you have? Um, because a VPAT is not the final answer. Unfortunately, we would love to have something like the Energy Star compliance tag, where you that's if that's there, you can trust that it is, in fact, Energy Star compliant. Um, there's no such thing in accessibility right now. And so um, if they claim that they are accessible via their VPAT, then we, we can't necessarily trust that. Um, we should, this should be a conversation starter. We want to engage them and talk to them about their commitment to accessibility. And by reading a VPAT, we can come up with some specific questions that we can ask. So example questions that you might want to ask. Um, is your product accessible is not one of them um, because that is far too open-ended. And if you're talking to a sales rep, then they're probably going to say yes and then try to back that up later. Um, but a better question would be in your VPAT, here's what you said on 1.3.1 on, uh, info and relationships. Um, and I'm trying to make sense of that. Could you help us understand what you meant by that response? And can you elaborate on how your product meets the success criterion? And you know, see what kind of a response that you get from that. Um, please describe your company, how your company addresses the need for accessibility throughout the product life cycle. Um, so that you know, anybody can ask that. You don't need to be a technical person to ask them about their company and about their strategies for addressing accessibility. Um, and you know, this is really, even if their product is inaccessible, if they care about accessibility and they've got you know, some, some, somebody who is in charge of accessibility, um, they've got some means of training their engineers or their quality assurance team on accessibility issues and they're integrating accessibility into their company culture somehow, then you know, that, that would give me a lot of confidence over, you know, even if they've got a bad product now, it would give me some trust that they're working to address this and the product is going to improve over time. Also, what is your methodology for testing your products for accessibility? Um, who does that testing? Which tools and assistive technologies do you use? So that it kind of ties in with the previous question. But we want to know more about their processes and their, their culture and you know how they address accessibility and same with the final question here what sort of training do your designers engineers and quality assurance personnel receive on accessibility so i, I want to um spend some time then looking at Carol, a few this is paths. monica hi monica I'm, I'm buttoned in here hope that's okay before yeah. you move on i just want to let you know um i know you're going to dive into some examples here in a minute. We've got two questions um, for you and I wanna draw your attention to them. The first question is about how often it's recommended to ask a vendor for a VPAT or updated VPAT. For example, is it just when signing contracts or with every contract renewal? I think that's a great question. And then another question is if it's possible to request a completed VPAT for free uh, websites or software such as soundtrap.com. So just thought you might want to consider those as you continue on in your examples here. Thank you. Um, yep. So on the, um, the, the latter question, uh, anybody can fill out a VPAT. Um, and so, um, and certainly, you know, free, there are a lot, lots of uh, tools that are provided, you know, for free that, that do include VPATs. Um, I don't know about the one that you uh, mentioned specifically, but we actually use the VPAT as a way of uh, documenting internal accessibility too. So web developers at the UW, if they're developing an application, then, you know, they can use the VPAT as a means of sort of auditing their own application. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's available, it's freely downloadable off of the internet, and, and you can use that as a form. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to request this of anybody with whom we are looking to sign a, an agreement, um, regardless of whether we're paying money for that product or not. Just because it's a way for us to understand more about the accessibility of that. 
um, of that product or service. Um, and the now I've forgotten what the first question was. <clears throat> uh, oh, how often do you ask? Um, <clears throat> I do think those those are the licensing uh, points are certainly it's those are a good time to to tie in to that existing you know process that when you're initially licensing a product definitely but um, probably at this point we've got a lot of inaccessible products out there um, and so we need to revisit the accessibility of those products when it's time to renew the license um, and if it's possible you know depending on the nature of your relationships with vendors to give them a heads up that you know we've got we got a renewal date coming up and you know we really need to to do something about our accessibility and so so just a heads up that yeah you know, we're gonna have some accessibility requirements tied with that um, license renewal and you know start working with them early if that's possible but i do think tying into those um you know kind of the existing uh, lifespan of the license uh, makes a lot of sense okay so, and let me know, Monica, if, if there are other um, questions that pop in. Meanwhile, I'm going to jump over and look at a few examples just to kind of practice some of this. So the first um, example here, we have um, criteria and we have conformance level. Um, if this were a meeting, I might do this more interactively where I'll let, let folks type in chat, um, you know, is this a good um good vpat or bad vpat um and actually we could do that perhaps um because we do have chat so um what do you think what's the problem with this vpat given the you know what we've just talked about this is monica you're absolutely right we do have chat function so attendees you are welcome to put in your thoughts about this vpat into the chat And I say, what's what's the problem? Um, and Vicky says no remarks. Initially, when I read that, Vicky, I thought it meant you have no remarks. <laughs> but now I see that you're you're answering the question, which is absolutely correct. Um, it's a two-column uh, table, and we know that the VPAT is a three-column table. So they, for whatever reason, elected to remove the third column and just go with the multiple choice. So. Um, and that particularly, oops, that particularly is problematic because it's not all supports. There are at least a few items where they partially support and we can't do anything with that. We have no idea how significant it is that they don't fully support non-text content. They don't fully support the no keyboard trap rule. Um, those could be you know, significant problems and we need to know more. Um, in order to, to judge. So example uh, two has all three columns, so we know that's good. Um, but, and this is fairly obvious, um, so I won't ask you to type in chat um, necessarily here, but the remarks, even though they have a remarks and explanations column, they have not used it properly. They have only filled that in for items that are not applicable. And that arguably is the only time they don't need to fill it in because not applicable kind of stands alone. Um, we understand that not applicable means the criterion is not relevant to this particular technology. They don't need to tell us that. They do need to tell us why they feel that for everything else here, they support uh, WCAG, um, the, the success criteria. So um, I'll also say that if, it's a 100% supports VPAT, then as I mentioned, I've never seen a fully accessible product. Um, and so I'm always very skeptical of um, something like this that, that claims full compliance, particularly with no additional detail. These, by the way, are all uh, actual VPATs um, and pretty recent um, actual VPATs over the last um, year that um, have come across my desk. So um, example number three, we've got all three columns. We've got um, standards that 
don't look quite like the standards that we have been talking about. And they're talking about server side image maps and client side image maps. This is the original section 508 standards um, from, from back in 2000, 2001. And again, this is a recent VPAT. Um, so um, this, and that, that kind of speaks to why we're not using those old section 508 standards anymore. They really are not applicable to the way the web works today. Um, and, um, and you know, not only that, but supports is probably not the best choice here. Not applicable is a better choice uh, because they're not using server side or client side image maps. Um, so it's a not applicable question. So, so the, the big problem here is they're using the wrong, uh, the wrong version of the VPAT. Next, we have uh, 2.1.1 keyboard. So this is one of those that we should be looking at. And we understand that that means everything needs to be accessible with the keyboard for people that are not using the mouse. So they say partially supports um, and they provide extensive documentation. Um, all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface without requiring specific timings for individual keystrokes. However, there are minor exceptions. For example, the calendar widget on the manage section is not keyboard operable. However, alternatively, the date can be directly entered into the date field. So, so I can imagine that. I'm imagining somebody using this application. They can't use a mouse. They land on the date field, and there's a calendar widget icon that they could use to select the date, but they can't get to it because it is a mouse-only feature but they can just enter the date into that date field and that will suffice. So, so the fact that that calendar widget is not accessible is exactly the kind of thing that we're, uh, we're interested in. Um, partially supports, you know, we always ask, is, are the shortcomings significant? Are they gonna block a person from being able to, to use this product for its intended function? And in this case, the answer is no. A person can fill out the date field even if they can't access the calendar widget. And probably it's a lot easier just to type the date in um, than it is to use the calendar widget anyway. So, so I actually, you know, I'm pleased that they have a really good command of what this success criterion is all about and that they are being so self critical that having you know, access to that calendar widget raised a red flag for them. Um, so that, you know, that really says a lot about their uh, commitment to accessibility. They're really paying attention to details and they're holding themselves to a high standard. So this is a really good example um, of a VPAT. Here's one for that, uh, that last success criteria we talked about, the one about using ARIA uh, 4.1.2, name, role, and value. Again, this is a partially supports. And their explanation is that the web application provides the correct name, role, state, and other important accessibility information for most form controls with the following exceptions. There's a dynamic filter result, which is not announced to screen reader users. And there are some calendar widgets that are not using appropriate roles. So, question about this one then is how significant are those features? Um, it, it's, that seems reasonable enough. First of all, it seems like they understand what they're talking about. Um, they're, you know, may, they may, may or may not um, just be trying to, trying to convince us that they know what they're talking about. But it seems, you know, this answer seems right, given what I know about ARIA. But now I wonder about dynamic filter results. Um, and calendar widgets. Calendar widgets, I mean, that was a problem, you know, with the keyboard interface as well on that other uh, VPAT. So calendar widgets seem to be um, a uh, you know, consistent problem. But, you know, um, the, the dynamic filter results, in my mind, are probably a bigger concern, not knowing anything about this product, because probably you need to filter um, your results. If you're shown a set of results that includes hundreds of results and you need to be able to filter those in order to use this product effectively, then um, 
you know, you change, you make changes to the filter through the filters, you make changes, but as a screen reader user, you're not notified that anything has changed. That seems like a pretty significant problem. So this is where, you know, reading the VBAT, trying to come up with follow-up questions um, comes in where, you know, this is something I want to know more about. So, you know, when I'm talking to the vendor, you know, on your VPAT 4.1.2, you mentioned the dynamic filter results. Um, with screen reader users potentially having a problem with that. Could you elaborate on that and explain, you know, how the filter results work and what the experience is going to be like for a screen reader user um, and help us to understand that? Um, so that's, that's a part of it. The other piece of that conversation then is, you understand this problem, you've documented this problem, and you've been very upfront. We appreciate that transparency. But when are you going to fix this? What's your roadmap for coding that properly so that screen reader users have access to the dynamic filter results? And meanwhile, while we're waiting, is there some kind of workaround? You know, can screen readers use this product, or is that going to prevent them from being able to use it effectively? Example number six, we have uh, actually included three success criteria. I think mainly I'm interested in 1.3.1 info and relationships, but I wanted to, to show the others that are included here too, both related to um, captions and audio description. So video related um, success criteria, because they did what one of the other VPATs did. They chose the word supports rather than not applicable when in fact, these are not applicable because there's no video in this product. So in that, you know, it might be an honest mistake, but it also could be, you know, they are aware that supports looks good. And when somebody who's not, you know, really educated about how to read a VPAT, reads a VPAT and they see support, 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 supports, that sure looks like an accessible product. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, I want to call their bluff here and say, you know, that's not, you know, an appropriate use of supports that should be not applicable. And you're trying to convince me of something here and I, I've lost a little bit of trust in you. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and, and assume that that's an honest mistake. But, but it does raise, you know, a yellow flag, if not a red flag. So 1.3.1 um, info and relationships. Uh, we have that this, this web app has proper information structure and relationship text, but there are some exceptions. And it goes on to list all the exceptions. And um, I won't name the product, but I will say that this actually went on and on and on several pages of exceptions related to information structure and relationships. So, um, so that's where partially supports versus does not support. Again, there's a little bit of gray area there. Um, but uh, if, you know, if, if it is mostly cloudy and you only get a little, you know, one little bit of blue sky during the day, then probably um, that is more cloudy than sunny. Um, and you, know, you should use the appropriate choice to, to identify, um, you know, the, the actual state of your application. Um, but, and I, you know, so I would, would talk to them about this. It seems like you have a very long list of exceptions here when it comes to information structure and relationship. So, um, you know, can you talk a little bit more about these and the impact that they have on, particularly on screen reader users, because that is who is most impacted by this particular success criterion. Um, next example, number seven, um, again, 2.1.1, this is keyboard, they say partially supports, they say that they chose this because um, users can operate all functions in the product using a keyboard through standard controls, but um, they, there are some isolated issues that do not substantially hinder use of the functionality, so that, that's a key piece there. That's what we want to know, you know, does the lack of keyboard support, you know, wherever that exists, does it impede a person from being able to use the, the product for its intended functions? They say no, 
So that's good. I want I want more, and they provide more. They say the publications imports functionality is not operable um, with a keyboard alone. Users may elect not to use this functionality and complete the task of entering publications manually. So, uh, so it's an optional feature. Maybe they don't need to, to import publications. Maybe they can just do manual entry, but that sounds kind of significant. Um, it's not, not required that they do this, but entering everything manually sounds a lot more time consuming than importing. So, so I wanna explore that more with them. Um, you know, I, I need to know the product better and I need to know how significant that, that difference you know, in approaches to this task um, might be. Also the rich text formatting toolbar functionality is not operable with the keyboard alone, but keyboard shortcuts do exist. Um, users may elect not to use this functionality. I think that that to me sounds like a, again, it's sort of being, being a little overly self-critical um, that uh, keyboard shortcuts do exist for the, for the functionality. So you can't access the toolbar itself, but you can use control B to bold. You know, that to me suggests that it's a different way of attaining the same thing. But, um, you know, if, if in fact, you know, this is true, you can perform all the same functions with keyboard then you know, that, that really is not uh, a failure. So, but the most important thing um, of all here is that last statement, a roadmap has been identified to remediate both of these known issues. So I want access to that roadmap. Now, anytime they say that they are making, you know, they're, they're working on this, um, you know, a bug has been filed. That's another one that we see a lot. Uh, I wanna see the bug. I want to, you know, I want to know when they expect to have that finished, and you know, let's let's work together to kind of agree upon a timeline that ideally would be built then into the the contract. We expect them to, to you know, follow their roadmap and make improvements in accessibility along a documented timeline. So I also want to mention. Uh, a couple of additional resources beyond VPATS um, that I think we, we all uh, may be interested in. One of those is the HECVAT, which is, uh, has been used already, um, mostly for documenting security issues with, uh, with technology. Uh, the Higher Education Community Vendor Assessment Tool um, 100 plus colleges and universities uh, actively use this. Uh, this is not integrated into our uh, purchasing um, formally with, at the University of Washington, but I don't, don't know about you all if you're using the heck that. Um, but they are releasing a new version um, at the Educause conference this, uh, this month. So October 29th, I put a question mark there. Uh, but I think that is there is a session on October 29th specifically on the HECVAT update. And uh, the new HECVAT, in addition to addressing security and privacy, has a bunch of accessibility related questions. So um, vendors are going to be expected to fill this out. Um, and, and the accessibility related questions may tap in a little deeper. Um, than what the VPAT does on you know, accessibility practices, you know, including how they integrate accessibility into their, uh, their culture and their, their product uh, development uh, life cycle. So keep an eye on the updates to the HECVAT, particularly if you, um, if you rely on the HECVAT as you're doing purchasing, because that, that may play a key role in accessibility um, moving forward. Um, the other is uh, a, a new project um, called the OPAT. Um, this actually is from some of the same people who are behind VPATS, uh, the, the GSA, the federal government. Um, but uh, Open Product Accessibility Templates, what it's called, it's available on GitHub. I've provided a URL there, but I think you can Google Open Product Accessibility Template and probably find it. But um, they basically are uh, creating, it's not a new VPAT, but it is a way to digitize the VPAT um, or digitize accessibility compliance reports. Um, VPATs are an example of, of those. And 
Uh, some of the benefits, as I understand it, I've only just started looking at this, so I don't have a complete grasp of what all they're doing. But one thing is by digitizing this, rather than having a template, you know, which is a form, people can download it, they can chop off the third column if they don't want that, they can skip required fields, they can, you know, enter uh, incorrect information in multiple choice fields. And, you know, there's a lot of freedom now to mess things up. But if they digitize this, there will be some self-validation built in. And so they have to fill it out accurately. They have to fill in you know, required fields or else they get a validation error. So that, that's gonna cut down on the number of validation errors. Also, if they have um, a standard digital form, then that makes it possible to have a centralized database perhaps where you can compare products uh, more easily you know, across the different um, you know, success criteria. And you can have better version control. So uh, able to track changes of a product over time to make sure you know, a product is moving in the right direction, those sorts of things. So this seems like a really good uh, project, definitely one worth um, taking a look at and seeing you know, how this might apply moving forward and um, you know, to the work that we're doing. So that is all I have prepared, but um, I am happy to answer any um, questions that folks have. Thank you so much, Terrell. That was incredibly helpful and super informative. There is um, a question and a comment um, in the Q&A feature, which I'll read out loud. And I'm curious um, how you, Deb, might be approaching this idea that shared with us um, by William. He says, it seems that many state agencies and schools use similar or even the same version of software. Is there a pool or shared VPAT database? If one agency has verified and approved, other agencies, colleges, et cetera, could maybe use that for approval. It seems like a lot of work is duplicated to approve or not approve things like uh, Math Lab, Visual Studio, Google Classroom, et cetera. Um, I, I will share that I, there, there's not something like that in existence right now for the CTC system, although that is a conversation and a desire that has been stated over the years and something I'm interested in looking at. I'm curious, Terrell, if the University of Washington is addressing that idea in some way. We've been uh, part of conversations related to that for many years um, through a lot of different organizations. Um, uh, AHEAD is one, the Association for Higher Education and Disability has taken that up. Um, we actually formed a small subgroup that explored that for a while and kind of reached a dead end. Um, and uh, it has been a topic for Athen, the Ac uh, Access Technology Higher Education Network. Um, and also kind of maybe I wouldn't say reached a dead end because it's still an ongoing conversation, um, but has not you know, resulted in anything tangible. Um, and Educause has also um, you know, been exploring this. And I would say that too is sort of an open-ended conversation still on the table, uh, but lots of issues keep coming up you know, in all these conversations about willingness to share you know, are we as an institution liable if we, you know, report on a vendor's lack of accessibility? I would personally, I think not if it's, you know, objectively measurable, um, you know, but that is a concern. And whenever lawyers get involved, they raise red flags like that. And that has kind of, you know, been a, been a showstopper. Also, the credibility of information has been a question. You know, how do we ensure that the person that's reviewing a product and then posting their review, how do we even you know, know that they are credible? And, you know, are we all measuring things in identical ways? Um, all these things I think are solvable, but another, another problem has been funding, you know, all the conversation has been volunteers who want to see this happening, you know, or people who want to see this, you know, this kind of thing, some sort of central database where we can all share information and share test results. Um, and, um, but we don't have the funding to support our doing that. And so, so it never has really gotten off the ground, but I do think, you know, I encourage anybody with an interest to get active in those conversations and probably the best place to do that right now is Educause. 
they're the IT accessibility community group. Um, and that, that too is easy to Google, get you know, Educause IT accessibility, and you'll find that group and, and can get, get involved in the discussions that they're having. I, I will also say um, that um, uh, Ward Naff um, has created something, I think, in the past. Um, yes, that, I could speak to that a, a little bit. Um, Ward Naff at Whatcom Community College created the ACT Accessibility Compliance Tracker Tool. And the goal behind the design of that tool is, is exactly this, to create a centralized place to share um, software VPATs and test results. I think the uh, very similar roadblocks have been experienced in that project, as, as you've mentioned. Um, so in, I would say all of the advice you just shared with us is, is really wonderful. And I too encourage people to look into maybe joining the EDUCAUSE IT Accessibility Group and conversation. And William, if you have interest and capacity maybe to consider uh, participating in some of these conversations with Ward and myself, we we invite people to join in and moving this forward, working with us. I'm gonna uh, take a pop, a little look into the chat and make sure I haven't missed anything. I see another comment again from William that says, I think there's a lot of power when multiple schools approach vendors and tell them as a group uh, that we do not wanna approve their inaccessible applications. Thank you for that That's comment. True. And we, uh, one thing that we do do um, at the University of Washington is, um, yeah, we we have the capacity, uh, perhaps more than than other institutions, to to actually work closely with vendors. Um, and so, you know, we've got um, a dedicated staff person that is, you know, full time focusing on vendor collaborations on accessibility, um, and his capacity is. Uh, you know, he's out of bandwidth. Um, so, you know, he's really got to sort of choose which vendors he collaborates with. But those collaborations are often open to other institutions. And so if you want to have a voice at the table, um, you know, then you could, and you're using you know, some of the same products we are. You know, we have active collaborations with, with Zoom, for instance, um, and, and Google and Microsoft on a number of their products. Um, and you know, Panopto, uh, lots of others. Uh, can the Canvas collaboration is kind of a model. We started working with Instructure many years ago, and um, and that we reached out through Athen to find other institutions who are using Canvas that might be interested in joining us and collaborating with them and working on their accessibility, and that ultimately led to a Canvas course that they hosted where we did our most of our collaborating using the discussion forum to log issues and discuss those issues. And um, we, and that still exists. We have over a hundred, about 150 participants now representing close to a hundred institutions. And so many of those are either Canvas customers or uh, Canvas um, uh, would be customers, potential customers. And that, at least in the early days, really had an impact, I think, on Canvas accessibility because they saw how many people cared about accessibility and, and really you know, dedicated some resources to, to making sure that their product met the needs, particularly of those potential customers that were you know, insisting on an accessible product. Otherwise, they were not going not gonna to do this. Thank you. That's great. I see another question that just came in. What thoughts do you have about accessibility testing of high priority user paths features versus full on blanket testing of a product? So that question I think is about prioritizing what you test when you are doing those reviews and assessments. Yeah, this is, um, this is important. Um, and that, that is actually, it speaks to how we do testing. Others, other institutions, you know, may approach it differently, um, and the accessibility consultants may approach it differently. Um, we don't, we don't actually use a VPAD or any sort of WCAG checklist. We are looking at functional accessibility, and every collaboration we get involved with, we sit down with the the service owner or service manager 
at the University of Washington. So it's the person that owns this product at the University of Washington. They're a key player in all this because they help us understand how we are going to be using the product mm -hmm. and what the key workflows are. Um, so if we're sitting down, you know, take Panopto as an example. Um, if, you know, uh, if I am consuming a lecture that was recorded at Panopto, what am I expected to do, you know, with this interface? What are the, the common workflows, the common functions that a person should be expected to be able to perform? And they'll make a list of those and prioritize them. And then we step through those, the, that list, um, step through each of those workflows, each of those functions using assistive technologies, using keyboard alone. And, you know, we're less interested in perfect compliance. If there are, you know, some images here and there that don't have alt text, if those images don't have anything to do with the function we're trying to perform, then they're less critical. Um, so we are, are more about, can we complete this task? And, and we do that, you know, with the, the vendor present and with the service owner present. And so everybody experiences this records those sessions and then we can we can refer back you know and say you know this is what what it looked like you know when we met and did this testing you know and then you know, track improvement over time um, try to try to hold the vendor accountable you know for fixing those specific issues that we that we've identified that makes a lot of sense thank you oh and mark says i think you you maybe answering my second question right now. And what is the second question? Let's see. It seems like there's a lot of space between reading for three criteria on a VPAT um, and, and a full dedicated test of a product, but a full dedicated test seems difficult to sustain with our resources. If you, yeah. if you wanted to, yep. Yeah, I think you were just addressing that. So looking at those critical um, uh, Fun functional tasks that the end user would be required to perform to engage with the product successfully and prioritizing evaluation of those things. Is that yeah, and even even then, and this is a dilemma, and I you know honestly don't have it solved. And I, I realize this. I've sent maybe mixed messages here that I I set out to convince you that this is easy and anybody can do it, even without accessibility knowledge. But what I just described, sitting down with the vendor and with the service owner and testing the product is a very different thing um, than, than reviewing you know, three items in a VPAT. Um, so that is a higher level. Um, and for, uh, for us, it, the difference is the, uh, the impact of a purchase. And so, we don't have we don't have as formal of a mechanism as we would like, but we're working on that internally. There are efforts to um, to better better organize the procurement process so that ultimately we'd like to have um, you know sort of a, a risk score for every purchase, and if something is a top tier risk where it's gonna affect so many students or so many employees or so many visitors across the, the institution that you know, it, this absolutely needs to be accessible. And that reaches a higher level and that needs to go through accessible technology services. We need to test it. We need to talk to the vendor. We need to sign off on it. Uh, we're not there yet. We don't have that kind of authority, but we do test a lot of products that sort of reach that level and, um, and we can recommend uh, purchase or not. And then it's up to the, the person making the purchase. You know, they have the choice as to whether they wanna take on that risk or not. We can tell them what the risk is. So, but that is a very higher, a much higher level um, of accessibility scrutiny that major products need to rise to that level. It mostly is the other things that we don't have the bandwidth to review. And we honestly don't expect um, the purchasing agent to be able to review just because, you know, even if they could identify the functions, maybe they could test with the keyboard, but uh, we don't expect them to learn how to use a screen reader and to, you know, to test with a screen reader because that, you know, is a very specialized skill. So, so it's those lesser priority um, purchases that, you know, sort of, that this presentation is more centered on, I think. 
That makes sense. Thank you. Again, I just want to thank you, Terrell, for sharing your afternoon and expertise with us. It's been wonderful to have you. We are right at 3.30 on the nose. Um, I will, I'd like to share that this, this has been a recorded session. So we'll, we will be sharing the video recording and the um, slide deck as well for, for future reference. People are welcome to email me specifically with questions. Um, and with that, again, thank you, Terrell. Thank you everyone for, for your attendance and attention today. And um, we're gonna close today's session. Great. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks again. Okay, bye-bye now.